Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education that will give you a skill set that will make you marketable for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach from Metro Atlanta. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent also from Atlanta, currently in North Carolina. And I'm David Williams, and I'm a dad from Chicago, Illinois. This week in the news, we'll be discussing an article by Colin Binkley and Jeff Amy. Financial hits pile up for colleges as some fight to survive. Mark and Anika will discuss Chapter 116 in the book, 171 Answers. What is need-based college aid and how do I get it? A question from a listener. How can we tell if a private college has decent financial help or is in danger of closing? And Mark's interview is in the final part with Taylor King on the value of public regional colleges. And because Taylor King talks in depth about Columbus State, that will serve as our college spotlight. Friends, 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 so much has happened since we met last week. You, If you heard our episode last week, I went into depth about changes in standardized test scores that I don't ever see coming back to how it used to be. And I listed about 17 schools, many of them, some of the most in-demand schools in the country that have decided to go test optional. Well, many more dominoes fell or shoes dropped this week, if you want to put it that way, including Amherst College, Haverford College, and Babson, to name a few. And what I'm going to do next week is give you a resource how you can track all this stuff, because my head is spinning keeping up with all the schools that are changing their policies every week. I've got an exciting announcement. So my oldest daughter cares. So you guys who are regular listeners have heard so much about, well, she had the big 24th birthday this week. And so one of the things I'm going to give her for a birthday present, I told her I would tell our podcast listeners about her Spanish tutoring business. Wow. So she is a fantastic Spanish tutor. She's been doing it for eight years. And when she actually took the test, she scored 100%. Uh, of course, she majored in Spanish at Davidson. She's got her degree in Spanish, and she's been to Peru, Bolivia, and Honduras five times, and very well-versed. And so she does Spanish tutoring through Zoom video sessions. And she'll work with a student who's trying to master the material or get a good grade on the test. And she also works with adult learners who are maybe trying to learn another language or improve their Spanish. And she only charges $37 an hour. So fantastic rate. And she even has like packages, like 10 hours. And you commit to 10 hours and she charges like two ninety. So she's just trying to help people. And I want to help her. So if you have any interest in either learning Spanish or having your child master Spanish, and you want to meet my daughter, either shoot us an email at questions at your com. Or you can actually even just text me directly at 404-664-4340. Might have to get Lauren on that, Dave. Get her to master her Spanish. Well, uh, you know, I need to master my Spanish. After 25 years in the emergency room, my Spanish sucks. <laughs> hey, <laughs> so, Karis so will I, take care of you. So we'll have, to, we'll have to get you a couple sessions in. That's right. Um, I never got beyond being able to order a beer and find my way to the bathroom. So if she can help me navigate more, <laughs> I am all in. You need help. <laughs> Well, she she finished up at in Peru in a Spanish university in Peru, which is oh, pretty that's cool. Fantastic. That's fantastic. I also want to announce that that um, you know we have decided not to do our episodes like so far in advance, so that when you hear us on air say the NBA is over, oh my goodness, and you hear it and you're like that was so old. <laughs> so what we've done is Dave's got a whole set of podcast equipment. He yes, is. I this do. is the first time he's recorded, recording from New Jersey on the road after a twelve-hour doctor shift. That's right. So that's yeah. dedication. So now we're doing. We'll be recording much closer to when episodes go live. This is actually Easter Sunday, and so uh, hopefully you'll appreciate getting fresh information from us. And speaking about Dave, Dave, you, you've yeah. transferred from Manchester into a totally. All COVID world now. Give us an update on uh, what's going on with you in the emergency office and 
and a, and a COVID update because you're more than anybody else. You've seen it firsthand. Well, yes, I'm, I'm now at uh, JFK Hospital in Edison, New Jersey. It's one of the hospitals that have been so severely hit by the coronavirus that it's almost exclusively COVID at this point in time. Uh, it's a hospital that has about 200 beds, and all 200 beds are currently uh, COVID-related. Uh, it normally has about 24 ventilators and an ICU of 30. But at this point in time, we have, of those 200 patients, about 160 that are critical and about 70 that are currently on ventilators. And so uh, I am one of uh, four doctors who actually manage the inpatient management of most of those critical patients. So it's been an interesting, somewhat stressful, but very enlightening week. So what? What have you learned, Dave, about COVID now that you're really seeing it up firsthand that maybe you didn't know before? Well, you've now had almost four days there, so that's a good 48 yeah. hours of doing this. So what, what, what would you say you've learned about the, this particular, you know, health problem? It's very sobering. The unfortunate thing that uh, once patients get on mechanical ventilation, life support, Less than fewer than ten percent get off. So ninety percent of the people who, in our our experience, get on mechanical ventilation, uh, do not survive. So uh, unfortunately, it can take several weeks of them being on ventilation before they eventually expire. But it's also a very very dehumanizing uh, disease because the problem is when people come in, either from home or from the nursing home their family members are not allowed to accompany them. The hospital is on complete isolation lockdown. So these people are admitted, they go to their room, they're intubated, and they spend the rest of their time alone. So when they are in the next week, their family can't visit them, their pastor can't visit them, their rabbi can't visit them. When they finally pass away, there's no one to hold their hand. There's no one to support them, be with them, uh, to see them through the other side. And when they do die, they're not having funerals. There's not a celebration of who they were and what their life meant and the significance that they had to others. They're usually sent off to a crematorium or to a mortuary, and they're buried alone. And uh, so it's very depressing when you take care of these patients and you see the fear in their eyes and their loneliness and there's no one else to help them. So, uh, you know, I really just want to reach out to every single family member who has uh, had the misfortune of being afflicted by this disease. Our hearts go out to you on this Easter Sunday. Um, it's a time when we think of uh, life, death, and resurrection. And uh, we just want to know that all of you are in our hearts and prayers and that we truly hope that we pass this terrible affliction. The good news is that there is signs that the curve is flattening, and I am hopeful that in the next three to four weeks we can get through this thing and put it in the rear view mirror. A slight story of levity. The unique thing about this is I've never been to ERs that have been so quiet because everybody's on a ventilator or everybody is sick, and so you just don't get the normal sense of chaos. But a couple of days ago, uh, I heard some screaming and some yelling, and I asked the nurses, what is all that? And he says, oh, that's just one of our local drunks. He's acting up. And I was just so happy to have a normal ED patient. I took him out of restraints. <laughs> I gave him a sandwich. I was like, hey, buddy, let me take care of you, because I know that was one patient that was leaving in the morning. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I've never been so happy to see a regular drunk in my life. So I'm hoping <laughs> for the normal chaos of the ED to return very soon and for us to get through this terrible time. So, Well, and Dave, I know a few of our listeners yeah. have sent in uh, emails or even spoken to me expressing concern for your health. Why don't you share our listeners what you told me, like the level of protection that you have on you? Well, the great news is that uh, this hospital is very well equipped with personal protection equipment. Uh, I was actually not quite prepared for how prepared. Uh, When you walk into the door, they take their temperature. uh, And if you have a fever, you're immediately quarantined. When you walk out the door, they take their temperature. They require you to wear two masks. 
and goggles. Uh, every time you enter a patient's room, you have to gown up and put on gloves and they have disposable stethoscopes. And every time you leave the room, you throw away the stethoscope, you throw away the gown, you throw away the gloves, and the second mask that you had on, you throw it away and put on a new <laughs> new mask. And believe it, believe you me, the hardest thing for me is just wearing all that equipment because it's hot and it's itchy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so and, and if you have the temerity to walk outside that room without disposing of your equipment and wiping down your goggles and so forth. There are a lot of hygiene police to put you in line. So, so the good news is that uh, we've been very cautious and uh, we're following all the protocols. And, and I, I feel very, very secure in my own personal safety. But for all of you that, that have voice concern, uh, it's much appreciated. And I want to reassure you that I'm doing just fine. Yeah, and I want to thank you for the hard work you're doing too, Dave, because I know a lot of doctors are, are not showing up and saying, I'm not going in there. I'm not taking a chance. And so it says a lot about about you that you're willing to do that rather than just take the easy assignment. So on behalf of all of our listeners and all the patients you work with, I just wanted to personally thank you for it's kind of being an example of um, sacrificing for the help of others. Well, thank you. But let's Mark. get off something so hardcore and a little yeah. morbid, actually. That's right. <laughs> and turn to a topic that actually is not all that inspiring, but it's reality. So an admissions tip is if you are having a hard time making a decision right now, if you're a senior because you couldn't visit colleges and yeah, you're attending, you know, you're doing the blogs and you're doing the virtual tours and you're doing the video info sessions and you're talking to people, um, you're doing your research Colleges are really working with you when it comes to the deadlines. Over 300 colleges have changed from May 1st to June 1st already, and that number is actually growing. And so if you need additional time on your decision, um, you should reach out. Just like we talked about how standardized testing, I don't think, will ever be the same post-COVID. I don't know if May 1st will ever be the same. That was already a date that was slipping. We call it National Candidate Reply Day or Decision Day. It's got some other names as well. Um, it is no longer that, not for this year. And um, that's because colleges got to do what they have to do to reel in students. And that involves uh, being more flexible on deadlines. So if you need more time, you should reach out and ask for it because they're being very, very accommodating in, in the climate that we're in. And the admissions vernacular, the word is depositing, depositing. You want to take a, a shot at that one, Dave? I got to think it's laying down some funds for your college. <laughs> exactly. That's a term that's used. So how the deposits come in are people depositing. And that's that's the confirmation. That's the contract with the money and the moolah to say I'm coming. So you, that's a term you may hear um, admissions officers use actually in the public context. It's not just inside baseball. They, they'll use that sometimes um, when talking to students. What do we got for the day, Dave? Article time. Uh, well, uh, well, I was going to say, you talk about yeah, a, a wink letter. That means that you're getting in. Well, once you hear the deposits, that's your blink letter. You're going to blink or you're going to pay it. <laughs> <laughs> that's where the wink letter goes to a blink. A blink letter. Let me tell you <laughs> with Lauren, I got that blink letter. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. <laughs> so is the blink the shock of the amount, seeing all the zeros? <laughs> the, the, the blink is the shock of the amount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. And and realizing, don't trade in your Toyota Corolla. You ain't getting that Tesla. <laughs> Long oh, you're story. crazy. You're all crazy. right, all right. But on to the article. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. All right, the article for this week is Corona's outbreak could cause losses of more than 100 million at some colleges. And this is a great article. Uh, the bottom line, it says that the colleges are going to take some seriously heavy hits between refunds for student housing and dining and parking, loss of athletic revenues, loss of value of their endowments. But we're going to take this point by point. So the first point of this article is that the biggest hit is that in the fall, many students won't return. And Mark, we've talked about this in a few podcasts. Uh, do you want to take it away and, and comment on this uh, 
huge risk? Well, the one thing I want to say is last week we focused on this because we focused on that study that was done of almost 500 students. And one of the things that was revealed in that study was that 16% of people who are planning on coming now are not planning yeah. on going in the fall. Yeah. But what I didn't mention last week is that that study was done in mid-March. Right. That was like done in, uh, I want to say that came out around the 20, 22nd of March. And so they were in the field like the 15th to the 22nd in that time frame. I may be off a day or two, but that's pretty close. And so if anything, that may be even exacerbated now. So you can understand the cause of, of the crisis there and why that's causing the freakout effect. Uh, but we spent a lot of time on that one last week. I think we should focus a lot of our time on some of the other points the article makes, Dave. Okay. Well, the second, which was related, was that they're projecting a steep drop-off in international students. In fact, they looked at University of Connecticut, and they said that they projected that they could lose between 25 to 75 percent of their international students for a projected $70 million loss. Yeah. And I think overall, one of the things about this article that is just staggering, um, and this will kind of go across points here, is how much money the colleges are looking at losing. Right. You know? University of Wisconsin it figures they've already lost a hundred million. Right. Bucknell says they've lost a hundred and fifty million from their endowment. And the numbers just keep on going and going and going. As you said, the University of Connecticut, three thousand students from China right. uh, drop by twenty five to seventy percent up to seventy million. Right. Um the numbers in this article, they're not in the thousands, they're not in the hundreds of thousands. They're they're in the millions, tens of millions, and in, in some cases, a hundred plus million. Right, and, and you know it also points out in this article that because of these huge cuts, this is affecting the colleges fundamentally on a structural level. And they mentioned about four things: number one, increased layoffs. Number two, the cutting of academic programs. Number three, hiring freezes. And number four, halting construction projects. In fact, they talked about Miami of Ohio cutting one half of its visiting professors because of its decrease in revenue. Any thoughts, Mark? Yeah, the yeah. thing about this, Dave, is this is cutting across all schools. Right. These are not just the tuition-driven schools. These are not just the schools that were on faulty or shaky financial grounds. These are not just the schools that, as I refer to as designer schools, that are non-designer names. Mm -hmm. The article, for example, said Brown University was among the first to right. announce a hiring freeze, citing right. dramatic reductions in re revenue. That's right. Okay. Yale, which we talk about quite a bit because Dave's daughter Lauren is there. Yale University followed on March 31st, asking departments to update their budgets in preparation right of a significant loss in revenue. Right. And I, I talked about this a little bit last week, but I'll go into a little bit more detail now. So one of the things that happens sometimes when I'm talking to really highly selective schools and their financial aid offices is you realize that they have financial challenges too. Right. Um, even before this, you know, I, I remember on two different occasions last year, I was talking to two of the most highly selective schools in the country um, about the fact that I didn't feel like their estimates for travel, when they do an estimates for travel, were accurate. And I'm not going to mention the schools, but they're the brand names of the brand names. I'll say that. And and so as it turns out, these are conversations with financial aid officers. And it turns out that they basically build into their estimate two round trip tickets all year. Well, that's not necessarily reasonable. By the time you look at getting there to start in the fall, you know. Some people would like to go home Thanksgiving, Christmas, spring break. Um, and so I said, well, most people are at least going to want to come home three times or they got to get there in the fall, let's say. Let's say they stay there Thanksgiving. What about Christmas, spring break? And then two different times I was told, well, that's not necessarily in the budget. So what happens with wealthier schools in general is they do the same thing individuals do. They have a lot more money, so they spend a lot more money instead of getting paid 45,000 for that professorship, you're getting 225, 225,000. 
And it goes on and on and on and on and on, whether it's the uh, pension benefits for faculty, whether it's the health care, the dental care, whether it's the amount of money they spend to bring in speakers. It just goes on and on and on. And so they've factored their extra money into the offerings and services. And one of the biggest things you see it is in the faculty to student ratio. Right. Because remember, staff and faculty, salaries and benefits is still the biggest line item. And so maybe there's a six to one ratio instead of a 15 to one ratio. So it's hitting everybody. What else you got, Dave? Well, you know, more on that line. They talked about the fact that the latest rescue package, that $2 trillion rescue bill that we've talked about, had $14 billion yeah. earmarked for higher education. That sounds like a lot. Yeah. But the American Council of Education actually requested $50 billion. And so they made the point that what's in the rescue package is not nearly enough to cover the projected losses from this whole coronavirus. It's really not. And and also the way it's set up, which is something that I support, the number of Pell Grant students is highly correlated to how much money you get. Yeah. So by the time you break it down, each school is really not getting that much. Yeah. Um, that's been one of the disappointments to me has been how little talk or dollars have gone into funding institutions right. from the rescue packages. Um, another thing the article talks about is um, that $3,700 check that you got back, Dave, because yeah. Lauren isn't going to be on campus for the rest of the year. That's right. That completely caught colleges off guard. That's right. That was money that they had expected and already counted on having in their budget. Right. And if you're paying somebody back because they're not staying in the dorm, that's not actually an expense that the school was allocating, right? That's just that's right. pure profit. That's right. Like, sure, they save a little on food, yeah. but because you get money back for not being in the dorm, I mean, that doesn't help you at all. And one of the quotes in here on that came from um, one of the small colleges um, Benedict College, historically black college in Columbia, South Carolina, is expected to lose $2 million in housing refunds. And that's out of a $52 million budget. So that's literally 4% of their budget has to now be refunded that they didn't have planned. And, you know, this article doesn't talk about this, but I'll interject it because it's true. Uh, the Arizona schools, some of them were not planning on doing a housing refund. And a bunch of parents got together and did a class action lawsuit, and then the Arizona schools changed their mind. So there's another thing that the colleges were not expecting. And, and to add to that even more, for those of us who own properties, we know that just because there's a vacancy doesn't mean the fixed costs of your building go down. I, I mean, they right. still have to pay for the staff. Maybe they're being furloughed. Maybe they're being laid off but you're still paying for the upkeep of the buildings, the heat, the electric, the insurance. Uh, you still have to maintain the ground. You still have to maintain some semblance of cafeteria uh, for the skeleton crew that remain. So the students being on campus represented almost pure profit to your bottom line. And that pure profit has totally vanished. Yeah, it's really true. And you know, yeah. one of the quotes I liked from this article came from the president of San Jose State, if you're listening, forgive me if I pronounced your name wrong, but it looks like Papa Zian. And yeah. so uh, Papa Zian has urged Congress to provide additional aid to help avoid damaging cuts. Right. It says her college is going to try to prevent layoffs, but it needs to do a whatever it takes to survive. And then this is what Papa Zian, president of San Jose State, goes on to say in the article. It says, this is what we had in 2008, but many times worse. Right. Papa Zane was referring to the Great Recession in 08. The right. herd is deeper this time, and the recovery period will be longer, right. and there will be many students who are lost or injured because of it. Right. So I know this is a really dour topic, Dave, but we're trying to keep it real with everybody. You know what? If we keep talking this way, I'm going to go back to my drunk that I met the other night and invite him to the podcast. He was a lot more beer. fun. That's right. <laughs> the drunk in the emergency office is better than the podcast. But he was, he was the life of my week. Let me tell you something. <laughs> well, let's finish up this article. <laughs> the two last points was saying that 
Number one, many colleges are not going to be able to meet their projected demand for financial aid. Bucknell is going to lose $150 million off its endowment, and that's just standard for many colleges. And that lastly, many colleges will close permanently. And they talked about McMurray College in Illinois. And to follow up on yep. that, in Crane Chicago Business, it talked about all the local regional colleges that may be closing in the Chicago area if they don't actually merge because they won't be able to survive as independent entities. So it just added more to what we know, that this is truly a catastrophe on many levels. And, you know, I think this is a good segue, Dave. I still am moved by John from California. We read his letter last week. And in essence, the summary was, I know you guys may think you're talking about COVID too much, but you almost can't talk about it too much. It seems like it's impacting everything. And I realize you don't have a crystal ball. You don't know everything, but I respect your opinion. I'm sitting here trying to figure out whether to put a deposit in by May 1st or not. I'd like to know your opinion on whether or not you think colleges are going to be closed in the fall. And so I would like to honor that request and engage in a little bit of speculation. Dave, why don't you share your opinion and then I will share mine, and we'll see if we agree or disagree. What do you think is going to happen in the fall? Well, here is the big conundrum with this coronavirus, and that is once we flatten this curve, will it reappear in the fall? And what we don't know is what level of herd immunity we have here in the system. The speculation is all over the place, from studies that show that in Germany it may be as low as 15%, to people in California that think it may be as high as 80%. Why does that matter? It matters because if in the fall we start congregating again and kids go back to school and this reappears and we have to go through a secondary shutdown, the first blow was one thing, but the, but the second blow could be absolutely fatal. So what's going to happen in the fall and what's going to be the solution? Well, the solution is a vaccine. But a vaccine we know is really, at most optimistic, a year away, maybe even more. Until we have a vaccine, we have no assurance that we are actually going to be safe once we back off the social distancing. So my daughter shared with me that one of her professors said that what's going around in the Ivies, and, and this is this is not verified, this is just what she said, is that they have a secondary plan that if they think that there's a chance of the virus recurring in the fall, that they are going to delay the opening of school until the spring and have the second year go through the spring and the summer and then merge into the third year. And my thought was I was totally against it. And uh, this differs from my wife. But I said, if that happens, then you just take a gap year. Number one, I'm just not going to pay $80,000 for you to take an online education for it to be suddenly disrupted and for have all the things that we expected to happen in terms of your extracurriculars and your research and the connections and the clubs be totally obliterated by this virus. It's just not worth it. I said, it would be better for you just to stay home and take uh, classes at Columbia College in film or art or whatever, and then come back to Yale when this is all over, where you can get the full value of a Yale education. It's just not what I'm going to pay for. My wife has a different opinion, but that's my opinion. And the other thing I'm saying is that because if you think you're not going to be able to come back for the fall, there's no way you're going to be able to come back for the spring because the virus is still going to be there. We're not going to have a a vaccine in the fall. We're not going to have it in the spring. So if that's your secondary plan, just tell us right now, and I'm not going to put down that deposit. You're going to live 70 years of God grants life. You can take another year off and do something other than spend $80,000 and go to an online school. I don't care if it's an Ivy or not. So that's my opinion. So I'm not going to spend as much time speculating on sort of what I would do, but I want to venture more into the prediction land. And it makes sense to do it after this article. My view is that it would be a catastrophe of such Herculean proportions for colleges to not open in the fall without some plan that I think it would, they'll make absolutely every effort to not do that. I did have two conversations with two college admissions officers this week about this. One was at 
uh, flagship school, a uh, large flagship school on the West Coast, and one was at a highly selective liberal arts college in the Northeast. And they both felt like that would be an absolute, absolute last resort. And we're not even thinking about doing that at this time. What I think is more likely would be a delay, like you mentioned, and a number of safeguards that are put in place. So constant temperature checking. There is some optimism that there could be not a vaccine, but an antiviral drug or maybe antibodies. And you you could actually speak more, Dave, to how effective that would be, whether they would have it or not. I don't know to the extent to which they'll be able to implement social distancing. It's going to be challenging, but I just don't see them going online. Uh, I'm not saying they wouldn't do online in the fall, but if they do online in the fall, they'll do it with something like what you said. That, to me, I could see them do. We're going to make the fall the spring, and we're going to go the summer, and you're still going to have, you know, you're still going to be able to have seven months of residential experience. I think they would do that before they would just expect people to take their regular courses in the fall. Now, where this could be really problematic is stuff like fall football season, because that's the kind of thing you can't just decide in August with spring training and all the, you know, there's a chance you could lose the fall sports season, which would, for some people, it's not worth going if you're not going to have that. You know, that can be, for some people, a huge part of their college experience. So I could see that giving up. And one of the other things that's difficult about something like sports is you almost have to make those decisions conference by conference as opposed to individually, you know, deciding what you're going to do with your own academic calendar. So I I remain an optimist that schools will resume in either in the fall or they'll push their calendar back. But I know that there are going to be all kinds of conditions put in place. Uh, I mentioned temperature checking. Who knows what other restrictions will be there? I also think there's going to be a whole insurance thing that's going to pop up because parents are going to be like, hey, I I want insurance, some type of insurance to cover me because I don't want to pay all this for online. I don't know if the colleges are going to have to include that in their packages. I don't know if that's going to come from the external market, but I expect a whole insurance market to emerge where people feel like they're protected should an outbreak occur and they have to leave in the middle of the year. I certainly think that that's something that that we can expect. I mean, they're really in a bind. They're in a pickle, Dave. Right. They, they really, really, really have a quandary because if they come back and people start getting COVID, that has a lawsuit written all over it. Yeah. Or if another outbreak occurs, but they just can't take that financial hit. That's 16% that said they won't go can become 40 to 50%. And then they don't have a school or the school they have is so drastically different than what they have now. It's just a skeleton. And so I just think it's almost a non-option. Um, they'll have to come up with another creative option other than online. It could be a delay. It could be a six week delay, or it could be even a semester delay, but I don't see oh, stay online in the fall, pay the money, and we'll decide later whether you're coming back in the spring. As a good friend of mine, when I was in theological school, was from Mississippi, used to say, that dog won't hunt. Well, now, folks, preface it by me saying that it's been a stressful and quite a depressing week. <laughs> so I'm probably feeling a little bit more pessimistic than I normally would. But let me just say that, kids, it's never been a better time, in my opinion, to take a gap year. Because the problem is we won't know any of this until November, December, January, which is the traditional start of the flu season. And by that time, it's going to be too late. By that time, your deposits are already in and cashed. Your kids have already made their plans. And, you know, to basically start the school in the fall with one expectation and then all of a sudden have a possible recurrence that requires us to do this whole thing all over again, to me, would just be a devastating effect on your college experience. I just think the idea of going to college... No, no, so Dave, we agree on that. Right. We agree on that. What I'm trying to address the question is, 
will what are the chances that colleges open up in the fall or some delayed version where a student could still get uh, seven months of a residential education? Well, well I, uh, that's I think, what I'm. I, I think it's very. Right. I, I think it's a very high probability that they will open because they have no financial choice. Okay, uh, so, the, we agree. Yeah, so we the, agree. Basically. The vast majority of colleges. I'm talking about eighty percent, except for the the top twenty. If they don't open, they would go under. So I don't think there's going to be. So we a choice. agree. Yeah, they have to open. The question is, is that despite their best plans and despite their best intentions, can they remain open if we have a recurrence of this pandemic? And I think that question is completely up in the air. I, I can tell you this: that the social distancing measures they have currently in place in China and Singapore are are totally unworkable, unfeasible, or untenable right now in the United States. Currently in China, my understanding is that they have an app that goes on your phone, and it's with a barcode. And that barcode basically color codes your phone green, yellow, or red. And they can literally track where every citizen goes with his phone where they go, what they buy, who they call, who they meet. And if there's any question that there's a recurrence of a pandemic, they can then automatically trace those contacts and automatically turn everybody's phone in question red. And if that phone turns up red, that person will not be able to travel outside their house they're not going to be able to buy anything. The government will know exactly what they are, what they're doing exactly, and have each individual on total lockdown. Now, that level of personal infringement on our freedoms, I think, is just not possible in this country. Alternatively, widespread testing, where we have the ability to test 80% of the population with not just uh, the test of so if you have the virus, but if you actually have antibodies to protect it, that's months away from rollout, and the logistics of actually having to do that are highly speculative. And then you talk about the college experience themselves. These are kids that are supposed to be mingling. The, it's, college is supposed to be the antithesis of social isolation. What are you going to do? Take temperature checks of kids every time they step out their dorms, every time they go onto an athletic field, every time they have a social event? It's just not workable. So I just see the colleges being sitting ducks for a recurrence of this pandemic in the absence of a virus. And if they say a virus is 18 months away, that automatically nukes out <laughs> next year. So I, I think they're in a terrible predicament. But I am this. Yeah, close. they are. But I think yeah. it's, yeah. it's and I and that was really helpful, that rendition, especially the yeah. explaining what the antibody and the antiviral drug, what that actually would mean in practical terms. I agree with all the stuff you said about mm -hmm. we can't be like some of those countries. And I also agree social interaction and engagement is so much a part of the residential experience. But I think people can get really creative when the other option is you go under. I mean, another example is work, the stay at home thing. Okay. Do any of us think that we're going to be at home for the next 18 months? No, because the economy would so go under that there'll be conditional ways in which slowly over time, there'll be some gradual rollout toward people going back just because we have to. Now, will another outbreak occur? Like you're saying, that very well could be the case. But we're gauging in much more conjecture than we ever have on the podcast before. Yeah. But we were asked to share our opinions right. and we try to um, answer all the questions we get. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're both, of, to summarize, well, before I summarize, I want to say something. One thing I absolutely would be doing if I'm in the process of trying to decide whether or not to pay to do, to do the depositing we talked about earlier and sign a contract, I would want it in writing that if you guys call off the fall semester, I'm granted a gap year. Because the one thing about gap years, they're not automatically given. Right. Um, schools build into their financial model a certain number of gap years. Right. So I'd be getting that in writing on the front end. If I have the view that I'm not going, if it's online in the fall and you're pressing me for my money right now, I'm, that's something I'm negotiating. Right. I'm negotiating that if it ends up being online school in the fall, that I'm given a, I'm given a gap year and my deposit is refunded to me. And you have more leverage now than you've ever had. So, and Mark, I think that's a great, that's a great idea. And, and let me just say something about online education. Mm -hmm. It's got its limits. 
I mean, my, mm-hmm. my daughter is supposed to be taking lab courses. She's supposed to be doing lab in chemistry. She's supposed to be doing lab in physics. There's no way that she's doing lab. And they made some cockamamie a way that they could do some sort of project, but there's no substitute from actually being in a laboratory and doing experiments and doing uh, research, bench research. So those experiences were completely lost to her. So maybe you can do online if you're a liberal arts major, but if you're in the sciences, especially if you're in pre-med, there's no way you can substitute organic chemistry and physical chemistry for an online experience. And the colleges know that. So I'm sorry, but my view about this right now is that unless I see some real progress on the vaccine, or unless I see some real evidence that the virus is going to be contained in the fall, you know, I'm really, really leaning towards a gap year. And and the last thing I'm going to say is, you know, my daughter was supposed to be doing all this research at Yale and You know, the summers are such an important part of building up your resume if if you want to go to med school or graduate school. That has been completely obliterated. So in its absence, she is looking at online courses at Columbia College in Chicago at DePaul, and the courses seem fine, and they're much cheaper. And to be honest with you, they don't seem that much different online (laughs) from what you're getting from the Ivies. So my point is, if you're now subjected to an online education, To me, it totally obliterates the difference between these so-called high-level Ivy colleges and the rest. An online course is an online course. And I think the Ivies and other colleges completely lose their premium if they're now going to say, well, we're going to be an Ivy college and we're going to charge you Ivy rates, but you're going to take it online. To me, that's just a waste of money. So no, no, no. So here's where we agree. Yeah. We, we agree on way more than we we don't disagree on much. Mm-hmm. We agree that the overwhelming number of schools are going to open in the fall because they absolutely have to. Mm-hmm. Maybe a month delay or possibly a semester delay or maybe on time. They'll take a bunch of precautions mm-hmm. to attempt to assure people of safety. But we agree that certain things will be lost and it will be very difficult to implement. Right. Uh, we can't do some of the things other countries we can do. We agree that there is there is a risk of an outbreak. Yeah. Again, and I think what you're saying is I'm not willing to pay for that and take that chance the way I'm thinking right now. Right. And I would even agree with you that if I was dropping eighty k, I would agree with that as well. Right. And well, if I got a guarantee that you'll flip me into a into a gap year if it's that way, then I would do it. But I would need right. that in writing. That's right. That's right. So we agree on on a lot and. You know, Joy's situation is a little different because she has a scholarship that covers almost all of her tuition. So the big expense that I pay is her room and board, and she stays in a nice apartment right. of which I have a lease with them that I have to pay whether she's in school or not. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. so we're kind of in a two. We're, right. So it, we're all in different situations as far as the, you know, that. And we also completely agree on how much is lost. Right. In the res- not having the residential experience. One of the things I want to say that's lost is what you don't learn about yourself. That's right. You learn so much about yourself. That's right. Yeah, you know, when you're forced to have to get along with a roommate who's different from you, when you're forced to have to initiate and join different clubs, and pick which clubs are you going to join and not join, okay. and then the networking and the relationship component that right. can be very helpful because so much education is student to student. Right. That is different in a residential context right. than it is online. So we agree a tremendous amount is lost. Yeah. And it's very hard to justify paying the full premium price when you know you're just getting a fraction of what you were expecting or what was promised to you. And, and let me just, if we're going to be totally depressing on this podcast, let's just go all in. <laughs> yeah, this is our depressing get it all out. This, this is the last game. statement, Dave. That's right. After this that. This is the last statement before my... <laughs> Before I get whacked with the ridiculous bill on editing on this one, because That's we're right. getting long, but go ahead. Uh, you know, I was reading an article that said that this is the worst thing to happen to this young kid's generation because they were already socially isolated. Between their time spent on Facebook and Instagram and the time spent on their computers, that we had already had kids that didn't know how to interact on a personal level, that didn't know how to reach out and touch someone and have conversations, and that we're all wrapped up into our little bubbles. And now we have this virus that's going to even increase our social isolation. And at a time when our country is so tribal, 
because we don't meet people who are different from us, who think differently from us. We don't have the interactions of actually having a smiling face and pressing the flesh and having that opportunity to be human and touch each other as people. Now we have this that's going to make it even worse. And what's the implications of that in terms of our society? And when we talk about a liberal arts education of learning from other people and learning of other cultures, how are we going to do that online? That's the whole point, folks. So take that away. Sure, we can get the knowledge content online, but we can't get the humanity, the morality. And that's what I object to missing. And you take that point away, then, then I don't care where you go to college. As far as I'm concerned, they're all the same. <laughs> so we're going to end on that depressing. Yeah, the only thing <laughs> I want to say is, yeah. and that was very helpful, Dave. I appreciated that. Yeah. I, I was very well articulated. That's what I just want to say is, let's say a school is looking at a delay from a September to a mid-October, and they did something different on their calendar. That's six months from now, and a lot can happen in six months. Right. So I'm going to remain optimistic that within the next four to six months, um, enough progress was going to make be made so that um, students will be back in college in a residential setting in the yeah. fall. I, I'm just going to be remain an optimist, and maybe it's because I'm partly in denial um, yeah. because I don't want to face what that would mean both for colleges and for students' experiences. But I really do believe that they'll do it, and I think they're just going to do it in a way where there's going to be a lot of changes. I mean, yeah. and, and the same is going to happen for going back to the workforce, by the way, too. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people that are going to end up going back to jobs that are in crowded situations, and there's just going to be, it's going to be different until we get the virus. I keep saying the virus, the vaccine. The vaccine. Um, but I think that we're also going to do the same thing on the work front. Some people are going to go back. Now, people are going to be less likely to do things like go to Six Flags and hop on movie theaters and hop on planes and go to beaches and things like that. But people still will be returning to work in yeah. contexts that, there will be crowds to a certain extent. Like, I don't believe we're going to go 18 months without that happening. We're just going to have to figure out a way to make it work. So anyway, let, we got our depressing podcast done. Let's, let's we do did. something uplifting next week, my friend. That's right. You know, poor Anika, she's going to listen to this and she's going to say, what got into you, boy? <laughs> I know. She was already COVID-19 burned out. She is burned out. Okay. Uh, Anika, before you listen to this podcast, remove all sharp implements from the roof. <laughs> yes. And all pills. And all pills. And no, and no, no alcohol around. No, not that she's a drinker, but you know what we mean. That's right. <laughs> Now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Okay, Anika, Matt, it's been a while since you've given us a, a John and Jalen and Janaea <laughs> update. What's going on with, with the three munchkins now that they're all at home with you? They are all at home. And let me tell you what's interesting. They are all here. They're all working, but it's still like the Twilight Zone. Like, I am so in a crazy funk rut right now because I feel like I don't know what time of day it is, who's supposed to be doing what. It's just like, Corona got me messed up. up. <laughs> <laughs> it got to it got to you without you having to catch it. Yes, yes. And, and Jalen, you know, Jalen's the medicine guy. So every time Janaea calls, he's like, stop, go do something. Dad. It's just like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. It's interesting you said that because I've been thinking about this, like, I've been thinking about this a lot. Like, how is this going to change society for the mm, future? Because mm. we're going to make it through this. It's not going to be a quick bounce back. It's going to take a while. Right. But one of the things is, imagine like being in a social setting and someone starts coughing and sneezing. People are like, oh, you better get out of here Let now. me tell you. No, we, my nephew, so my niece and nephews are here for a few weeks. And, you know, when everything first kicked off. And my nephew mistakenly sneezed in Walmart. When I tell you this woman, beeline, she turned her cart so fast. <laughs> So we you've already sat, seen it happen in action. And laugh. We, I'm sorry. It was. It might be a sister, but we did like because he was like, "Oh my!" Because he has absolutely nothing. But the fact that he sneezed was just enough yes. for her to run for the hills. It was crazy. That's but that's one thing I don't like about it. Is it's like going to make us all scared of each other. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and that's what it did to her. Sorry, lady, wherever you are. Hopefully, she's not a listener. Right. <laughs> you might get a different kind of email coming this week. 
Sorry. You I'm are so sorry. insensitive. You know, I was me. You were talking about. He does not have the virus. Let me say that. He does not. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's get down to business. So we are in chapter 116 of a book I wrote called 170 Inches to the Most Asked College Admissions Question. The name of this chapter is just what is need-based college aid? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a two-part series we're really doing on this topic because next week we're going to really delve into how do I get more need-based aid. But today we're mostly focusing on what is need-based financial aid. Anika, you read the chapter. What are your thoughts? I did. And, you know, we've talked about this between us so much. It probably on the podcast too. I can't remember. But it is money from the college that is given through an analysis of your family's resources. Basically, they have determined how much you can afford to pay based on their cost of attendance. And they're going to give you some money. Maybe not a lot, but some money. Does that sum it up a little bit? Um, a little bit. A couple of things I would add is need-based financial aid can come from the government, the state, or the college. It can come from any of three sources. Now, need-based financial aid from the college itself is, is where the bigger need-based aid awards are. Normally, the state has limitations, but it depends on the state. I mean, there's some states are incredibly mm-hmm. generous. That, that's all about politicians and what they pass through their legislation. The federal could be as much as ten thousand. That's a maximum per year. Um, in hmm. rare, it, that's very rare that it's that much. Most students don't get any free federal need based aid, right? Um, so there are three sources, but I know, and the institution can be where there are potentially really, really large amounts, but you have to qualify. Any questions at all you have for me after reading the chapter? Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a question on what you just said. You said okay. free federal based aid. Is there such a thing as that? I thought federal aid was all like through loans. No. So you've heard of the Pell Grant. Yeah. Okay. Talking, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Okay. Yeah, that's a complete federal program. That's actually episode one eighteen. So we'll delve into okay. that in one eighteen. Mm-hmm. That's a huge program, like hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, mm-hmm. That program, but we'll talk about that in episode 118. There's another yeah. program where we're talking about that might even be the following week called FSEOG. Mm-hmm. That's another federal need based program. So there's some, there's some need based programs that are, that are out. Th- yeah, it is 119. So 118 will be doing, I just had to do the little flip my pages through the book and check while I was online <laughs> with you. <laughs> I know our list is going to hear those pages ruffling. I knew you could remember everything. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. You have people over here thinking I got some photographic memory and I'm like shifting the book around. Uh, but don't get it twisted. He does. Because <laughs> I know your brain well, by now. So, but no, I do ha- I do have a question for you, actually, because sure. one of the part of the chapter, you talk about how the reason why p- schools give away need-based aid. And yes. you talk about it kind of like in a theoretical kind of way, like they feel like they're doing a benefit to society, you know, in terms yes. of, okay, we want to make sure that these, these kids are lifted up, the ones that want to go to college and they can't afford it. So is that really the case? Of, I thought need-based aid was, I thought of it more of like a thing that you just have to do, you know? No, mm. no. Okay. So that's, so let me read the quote that you're referring to and we can talk about that. So uh, it was actually Yale. I, I took something actually right off their website. Here is how, this is what the this I say in the book. Here is how Yale describes their rationale for their commitment to need-based financial aid. Need-based aid allows us to direct our institutional resources to the students who truly require and will benefit the most from them. And it helps maintain socioeconomic diversity at Yale. So it's, so it's, it's really two things. The second one, I'll take the second one first. All of these educational institutions really believe that when you surround students with something, with different people, with different views, different perspectives, all aspects of diversity, right? Ideological diversity, socioeconomic, gender, race, I mean, sexual orientation, philosophical, geographical, all of that, that you sharpen people's thinking develop them as critical thinkers and you prepare them for the world that they're going to go into where they're not going to be able to just be isolated in their own enclave and they'll meet different people. So you're preparing them for the real world. So that's how, and also 
the way you, you strengthen their thinking is because your background, you know, you grew up in a rural farm versus, you know, in the heart of Manhattan, you'll read the text differently. You'll see things differently. Hmm. So it's part of their educational mission. And they also believe that part of their educational mission is to elevate society, to take people and remove some people from poverty. And if you take a family that's in poverty and you give them education, you can transform their whole uh, lifeline for generations to come. So for a lot of them, that's an important part of their social mission. So does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Anik and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length. Usually it will be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that 5000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. So let me ask you this. Is there a school on this planet that does not give away need-based aid? Yes, a lot of really? them. Because, really? Oh, wow. yeah, a lot of them. So the government aid, of course, they give away, right? Because it's not the school giving it away. Right. Right. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so everybody can qualify for government programs. But what a lot of schools do is they say, look, we do not have enough money for the demands of our students from a need-based assessment. Hmm. In fact, only two and a half percent of four-year colleges even claim to meet 100% of a family's demonstrated need. So it's very, very rare for a school to be able to do that. There's really, last I checked, only 77 schools that can actually do that. And with what we're going on with COVID, that number is going to go down, by the way. So it's a small number to begin with. So that means the other 97 and a half who can't meet full demonstrated need, they do one of two things. They either meet part of need and they'll give a need-based award, but it's a partial award. Or, and I'll share a brief story with this, I had a, a faculty member who came up to me and said, and I'm going to mention the school, because I just am, they said, you're not going to believe this. This student got into LSU and they gave him a couple hundred dollars. And this was a poor kid. Hmm. So what a lot of schools do is they say, well, first of all, state schools oftentimes will pr prioritize the state in-state residents, right? Because you've been paying taxes. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of schools say is, look, we don't have enough need-based resources to meet the needs of everybody. So we're in effect going to take our limited resources and make them all merit mm -hmm. because we don't want to lose out on the strongest kids who are applying. We don't have enough money for everybody. Wow. So let's give all of our resources that we're able to give away exclusively a way to the strongest applicants to make our school stronger. That is very common hmm. and extremely common with HBCUs, by the way. Whoa. Like that's that the is. most normal way that HBCUs give money away other than state-based. You mean is through, it strictly through merit? Through merit. Wow. Yeah. Because they're, they say we don't have deep enough pockets to meet the needs of everybody. So let's give the money to the strongest kids. Well, but you don't have so to, different. but you can't, I mean, every we know everybody can't meet the need, but you can give them something. Like, why, is it all, some why is it all or nothing with those schools? Uh, the ones that are all or nothing, it's because their money is usually so limited. Mm. It's so limited that they don't want to miss out on those high flyers. Wow. 
Yes. So that, I mean, that's a good question. Like, why can't you give something? Mm-hmm. Most schools with limited resources give something. But giving all your money in the way of merit is also very common. Wow. That, mm. Any other questions at all, Anika? Mm-mm. Uh, so there's, there's something else that I wanted to say that's very important. It's also, I'm going to read from the chapter, actually. Something that Seth Allen said, and Seth Allen is one of the most experienced admission vets. He'd be a great, great interview on the podcast. I'll have to reach out to him. Ooh, yeah. uh, he's been at a lot of places. He was at Grinnell for a long time. Now he's been at Pomona as the director of admission for, I think this is his 10th year at Pomona. So I'm re- reading from my book and quoting Seth Allen. As Seth Allen, the director of Pomona, likes to say, need-based aid is not want-based aid. You are not the one who determines the need. An outside formula does that. So what does that quote mean to you, Anika? That means you better keep your expectations low. (laughs) I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah. And the reason for that is, I will tell you, for every 10 families that I work with where there is a family income of over Mm 100000 but they still qualify for some need-based aid, one in 10 will agree with the formula. Uh, I'm sure. Nine out of 10 will be, they think I can pay 52000 or 21000 or 33000 you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Like, what planet do they live on? So it's just something to be aware of. And why do you think that would be true? Why do you think most people would disagree with the formula? I mean, obviously, I know what I'm really paying. I know my kids are fancy and they like to eat certain things. And <laughs> I know what my real-time expenses are, which I know absolutely don't go into that formula, whatever that mysterious formula is that those people use, or I should, those people that are being used to determine what you know our need-based amount is, basically. I mean, you summarized it pretty well. The way I would say it is a couple of things. One the formula doesn't take into consideration a lot of expenses, which everyday families have now. Mm-hmm. Things like, well, for one, having a second parent as a worker, that right. leads to a lot more expenses when it comes to needing a second car, oftentimes, clothes, dry cleaning, gas, a lot of times more restaurants. Um, mm-hmm. That all comes with that. Then you have things like internet, cell phones, which are just part of our everyday expenses. Right. And so are and, and, and are necessary too, by the way, people doing right. that formula. You need to recognize that. They know that. Yeah. So a lot of us feel like the formula hasn't adjusted to sort of modern day living expenses. And then mm. the other thing is, this is just a fact, the more people make, the more they adjust their lifestyle to what they make. The family that makes 350 doesn't live like the family that makes 150 that doesn't live like the family that makes 50. They just don't. They make different yeah. decisions when it comes to houses, make different decisions when it comes to cars, when it comes to clothes, when it comes to vacations, when it comes to maybe putting their kids in private schools. You know, they just do. And the formula doesn't really account for that very much. Like it doesn't really expect you to adjust your lifestyle to your income. And everybody really does that. So that's why the more your income goes up, the more people feel like, how in the world do they possibly feel like I could pay this? So I just want to say that. That's important because sometimes people get really excited about need-based aid. And I think it's important that we kind of underscore that. Yeah. And did Mark, didn't we talk about it one time, the last time this formula had been updated? Like, when was the last time it has been updated? Some changes have been made to make some improvements, but not like it needs to. Mm -hmm. Not like it needs to. Now, boy, I've never done so much reading from my book, but I'm going to read a couple. You know, in in my book, I always have true stories at the end of every chapter, and Mm -hmm. I have an illustrator paint a picture of the stories. And this chapter, I had had two stories. And so I want to read them briefly because they kind of make a point. So I say, Trevor was being courted by Yale. He had the grades, test scores, and rigor that Yale likes, and he was also being recruited as an athlete. And the basketball coach wanted him to play at Yale. But Trevor's dad, Dr. Jones, had a successful medical practice as a surgeon. And Trevor could go to Yale, but Dr. Jones was going to have to pay the full tuition because Trevor didn't qualify for any need-based aid. And this is the only type of aid Yale gives. So it's important to know, like, sometimes a family thinks, it's important to know if a school only gives need-based aid, do they only give merit-based aid, and do I qualify? 
So in that case, this is somebody they really wanted, but he's going to have to play the full 80. Now, my second story, Courtney was in the top 3% of her graduating class at Westlake High School in Atlanta. She took AP courses. She had the test scores and GPA. A lot of her classmates were telling her, stay home, get the Zell Miller scholarship and only pay room and board. But Courtney was one of four siblings and her mom was a single parent. Vanderbilt's generous need-based aid coupled with the family's financial need made Vanderbilt a better financial opportunity than staying in state and going to her own public institution. Need-based aid really benefits talented kids who qualify for a lot of money. Any thoughts on any of those things, Anita? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it was a reminder on how, you know, those expensive schools can actually not be that expensive. Like, I was Correct. like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so need-based aid is great if your income and assets are low. And while we're going to get more into how you can qualify for more need-based financial aid next week, the bottom line is it is an assessment of your income and assets of the student and the income and assets of the parent. The only problem with the Courtney story that I shared is those 77 schools that can say they meet a family's full financial need and they can oftentimes be cheaper than your own in-state option. They're also the hardest in the country to get into. Right. Yeah. So even that they give away need-based aid, in effect, it kind of becomes merit because you're going to have to be really, really strong as an applicant to get through their admission process. All right. That's all I got. Whew. All right. And sidebar, I can't make, wait to meet Dave. I just... <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you say that? Because I'm in this Corona funk and I'm just like, oh my God, I need to meet my co-host. <laughs> you know what? It's so interesting you say that, Anika, because I was literally thinking just today, I said, the three of us need to do a Zoom meeting. Just the three of us. Oh, that we haven't done fun. that. I have, listen, I've been doing Zooms with my girlfriend. Like we like have drinks together. Yes. <laughs> a week. Well, actually a couple of, we, we've been doing drinks, but not that we have to do a drink, Mark. I know you don't drink. But yeah, that would be fun. But I, but no, I've been slick. Like I want to meet Dave in person. Like I want, I, I envision myself going to Chicago, going on some family oh, trip. You know and, what? You know what? So he does get to Asheville because that's part of his territory, and he has ooh. a little free time. I know he'd be happy to meet you halfway. Okay, Dave, here I come. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be fun. You're gonna get a chuckle off this one. You're right. That's one. That that's not a Zoom one. That's like an in person meeting. You need yeah. To do that. Corona yeah, got me I'll, thinking about all kinds of stuff, clearly. <laughs> what are you going to do? Like, you're going to tap in his brain and all his, get all his medical answers out of him? He's your medical guy? Everything, Dave. Get ready. Just be prepared. Sorry. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I thought about doing a little, a little special intro thing with Dave on the podcast called Ask the Doctor oh, and have ooh. people send, send their health questions in. Okay. <laughs> this is a college admissions podcast, Mark. Don't be trying to. <laughs> you don't like that idea. <laughs> I mean, people be looking all kinds of little little tips about their diabetes and their this and that and the other. Podcast number two. Podcast number two. Okay. What about like every now and then, every blue mood? Podcast number two. Okay, you you vetoed that idea. Let's shoot it down. (laughs) Okay. All right, partner. What, What do we got for our question from a listener? It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right. This week's question is from Kim from NYC. Kim, God bless you. I know y'all are dealing with it up there. Good gracious. I just got my child out of there or in that area. Um, and I'm gonna, she has some nice things to say, Mark. So I'm just going to read her verbatim here. Um, it says, hello, I love your podcast. It's a wealth of information. I recommend it to everyone. I know who has have teenagers planning to attend college. We're a family who is unlikely to receive need-based financial aid. Yet, like many, we will not be able to pay full price for a private college. Therefore, we are very interested in schools that give merit aid. We've been advised to look at schools where our son's stats are in the top 25%. And many of these schools are ones that admit a high percentage of students and are less nationally known. So the question is, how can we tell if a private college has decent financial health? And where do we do our digging on the website and and common data set to get info on this? If that school offers good merit to a fair number of students, does that indicate that the financial health is at risk or good? All right. So so Kim had a lot in this question, but it's actually a question that quite a few people have set in in different forms. 
Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, the way it's come in has been something like this. You guys have talked quite a few times that a number of colleges are going to close over the next, you know, 10, 15 years for a lot of different reasons. I don't want my child to go to one of these schools is going to close. How can I know whether school's on shaky financial ground? So it's just come, we've had at least three, I think maybe four people send this question in. Now, Kim has so many good questions in here that we're going to take part of her question next week. Uh, but I do want to dive into a lot of it this week. Now, what I will say is this is going to be a very meaty answer with a lot of content. And so this is one of these times where if this is an important question to you personally, it's probably not one of those times where you're just going to be able to listen to this in your car while you're walking your dog, while you're doing your dishes and all the different ways people tell tell me they listen to our podcast. You can do that. And I'm not discouraging that, but if you really want to know the answer to this, this is literally one you may have to go back and play a second time, or you want to sit down with your notepad and your pen out, because I'm going to give you about eight or 10 different sources, which is quite a few. And and so that's just a little hint, 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 hint. All right. So fantastic question. So let's dive in and talk about some of the ways you can know whether a school is shaky, shaky or on stable financial ground when it comes to their their finances. Where do you get this information? First thing is it can vary from public to private a little bit. And um, while I know Kim specifically asked about private, I I will briefly touch on some of the differences between both of them. One of the things you want to do when it comes to looking at this information is you want to look at trends over time. And so I recommend at least looking at the last three years. And some people that are even more fastidious than me may want to go back and do a five-year search to look at trends. But at least the last three years is what I recommend looking at so you can see the picture. A single year just kind of really doesn't do it justice. Another thing that I want to say is be careful about looking just at budgets. Budgets are okay, but budgets are a plan. Uh, about the When you're looking at the optimal fiscal health of an institution, you really want to look at actual financial reports and especially the most recently completed financial reports. So don't get fooled by looking at a budget versus an actual financial report, and ideally an, an audited financial report. So where do you get these reports? So lots of sources here. One of the f- most fantastic sources is something that's produced by the U.S. Department of Education. And we just refer to it because the name is so long as iPads. You ever remember me mentioning that, Anika? I've mentioned it once or twice on the podcast. Is that, is that- no, I don't remember that. No? Okay. So so iPads is just an acronym, and it stands for the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System. You see why everybody calls it iPads? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's too big of a mouthful. I'm not going to say it again. It's just, it's just, that's too much. That is too much. Right. As my daughters would say, Dad, you're doing the most. That's like doing the most. <laughs> of course, when I try to say that, I'm not allowed to use that. I guess that's only like like something for teens and 20s to use. I said the other day, I said, Joy, you're doing the most. She looked at me, really, Dad? You can't use that word. <laughs> Come on. Like Joy. she has control over the words Hi, I use. Joy. <laughs> Are you supporting her? No, I meant like, right? Like, are you crazy? No, it's important. Yes, you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if your kids do that to you, but mine do. Too. They do. Okay, you can relate. All right, let me get back. Let me get back to focus. <laughs> so IPED's financial report has all kinds of sections on each institution, assets, liability, revenue, expenditure, scholarships, fellowships, tuition discounting, endowment, which Kim has a question. Next week, we're going to get more into endowment. She had a good question about that as well and for public institutions on their debt. And so you can get all of this information from the IPEDS website, which is really good. Also, every college or university should have an IPEDS coordinator. And mm. sometimes you can actually just reach out, ask for the IPEDS coordinator, and request a copy of the most recent IPEDS financial report. Sometimes they'll actually send it to you. So that's one source. And I was going to make this our recommended resource of the week, the iPads information, but this week and next week, I have two super time sensitive ones. So I'm going to put this as our recommended resource in 118. So you'll hear me talk more about this iPads information and how you can get it on 118. So that's one way. 
is tapping into the iPad's data, which is extremely re- robust, extremely robust. And it is there for like 4,500 two and four year colleges. It's, it's there. Even like for profit um, have iPad's data. So that's one thing. Now, many public colleges and universities have even more information and you can get a lot of information from them. One other place to look is an online fact book. You can search the name of the school and see online fact book and see if they have that or just search financial reports for the name of the school. Sometimes they will list them. You can also reach out to each college's institutional research section, which is a wing. Every college has an institutional research wing. They are. Pretty much every college has an institutional research section on their website. Did you know that, Anika? No, I did not. Look it up for your school. Look up your school institutional research. Right now, see. right You'll, now. Mm-hmm. Yep. Do a little digging. You'll see. So that's a great place to get this. You can also reach out to the finance office or the office of the president or chancellor. Those are other really good places. And you can ask uh, for the financial reports, not the budgets, the reports. Public colleges are required to file reports with your state agency. So you can also look up your state higher education agency and you can get the reports for public schools there. So a lot of places, uh, these are available. Uh, The financial reports, if they're not available on the website, reach out to institutional research section, finance, president or chancellor. Now, what about private schools? Very similar in some regards, but there's some other options. Private schools do have a lot more leeway in terms of what documents they make public. I don't know if you remember when we had Gregory Roberts on from the University of Virginia, Anika, Mm -hmm. uh, for an interview. This is now about, oh, over a year ago. Oh, goodness. But he talked about as a public institution, we got to make everything public, like all the salaries, all that stuff is out there. Hmm. Okay. And you don't have a choice. So public schools have some more robust uh, requirements that they have to share. But for private institutions, you still have a lot of options. iPeds is one. Another thing is private schools have to file a form called Form 990. Mm. And Form 990 is a public document. They have to file with the IRS every year. And it includes all kinds of financial information, expenditures, changes in assets, balances, liabilities, compensation, a lot of things. And they also have to include their audited financial statements. So you can just do a search for a Form 990 for the name of your school. And there's some great place to get information. You can also do a search, look up the Foundation Center, and you'll see a list of a lot of 990 information. And you can also do a search for GuideStar, because GuideStar lists a lot of the 990 forms online. I told you there's a lot of information you need to pen for this one. Mm-hmm. I wasn't lying there, Nico, was I? You were not. And I'm not even half, I'm about halfway done. No oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So this is another thing. Now, a great source for private colleges and universities, they tend to have fully developed staffs with development offices, sometimes called advancement offices. Now, you know about that. Uh, yeah. And the development or advancement office, they produce an annual report. And basically, the annual report is pretty much a detailed annual financial statement. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great source to look at the finances of the school. Highly, highly recommend. Now you know I'm a neek and a nerd on this stuff because I enjoy reading those. (laughs) 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 I know, that's bad. (laughs) I do. I can love reading that stuff. Never will. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> now, for, for <laughs> to each his own, I better switch because I don't know what you're going to say over there. <laughs> Throw a brick at me through the phone. Oh, gracious. For, for, does it sound like you're kind of reading? Is that what you're trying to say, Anika? I mean, certain things. Yeah. I just. Okay. Yeah, there I we won't. go. <laughs> hey, I, I, okay, I hear you. So, for, for profit institutions, I don't really want to spend, we don't talk about that as much on here. But they tend to be less forthcoming with their information, less likely to provide this kind of comprehensive information. They do, though, have to report still to iPads. They don't have to provide as much detail to iPads as public or private nonprofit. But if you're looking at a for-profit, I'd, I'd recommend iPads as a source. Now, let me give you a couple other sources. Common data set, which we've talked about quite a bit. But I'll tell you where to go. Go to Section B1 and look at total enrollment. Look at it for graduates and undergraduates. You want to see enrollment trends, extremely important because most schools are tuition driven. 
are the, is the school going up or down when it comes to enrollment? That's very, mm. very important. Okay. Um, and that's easy to get. Just go to section B1 and you can, you can look up common data set for multiple years. For those of you who haven't heard us talk about common data set in the past, you're not going to find a common data set.com, common data set.org, but you could just do a Google search, common data set name of school, and most schools will have it. Go back and listen to a couple podcasts ago. We went into a lot more detail on what it is. Maybe was that last week or the week before, Nick? It was real recently. Nah, it's recent. Yeah, let's call it that. Recent. They're all they're all like melding together. <laughs> For sure. So that's one place to go. It doesn't tell you the whole picture though, uh, but it tells you an important picture, enrollment trends. It definitely is a bad sign if they're going down. I can tell you that. Hmm. You can look at section C one where you can see their enrollment, how many people are applying. Okay, are the applications going up or down? That's worth knowing. It's not as important as enrollment because enro- if, they're not, if they're not matriculating, they're not paying money. But it's still a sign of financial health if, if the school is getting increased applications. Hmm. Another thing you can look at is the yield. I'm going to see how well I've taught you. What's the yield, Anika? The number of students that have accepted and enrolled. The percentage of people that accept your offer. So the percentage well, of people. No, 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 no. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Offered, accepted, and enrolled. Like they're in there. Correct. So the key point is it's a percentage, right? Yield is a percentage. It lets right. you know if you put 100 offers, admission offers, how many people enroll in your school and say yes. So it's, an, it's a good indication of what we call brand strength, strength in the marketplace. So all that information is on section C. You can look at enrollment trends for the last few years and see is the school. Now, keep in mind, every school is experiencing decreasing yield to some extent as people apply to more schools. So that's not as important as enrollment trends hmm. or even number of applications. Section D2 will let you know how many transfer students are coming in. G1 expenses and then H1 and H2 are really important because they're going to show you how much need-based and merit-based money the school is giving away. And the reason why that's important is, okay, a school may be attracting more students but they may have to offer them so much money to get them to come that the actual average amount of revenue they're getting per student isn't that great. That makes sense or not? I think so. All right. So let's say, for example, you ha- I'll use a concrete example, which I think will help because I feel like I'm being a little theoretical here. Mm-hmm. So let's say you have a school and let's say you typically, let's say your school has, I'll just say the school has 10,000 students. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you lose some school students due to attrition every year. So let's say that you need to enroll like 3,000 kids every year because you're going to lose some. Let's say you lose 500, so you keep 2,500 for 10,000 total, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you just look at enrollment trends, let's say you look at enrollment trends and you say, okay, they brought 3,000 in in 2017. Oh, they brought like 3,100 in 2018 and they bought 3,200 in 2019 oh, this looks great. They're enrolling more people. So you think that's fantastic. But what if when you go to the financial information, H1 and H2, what you find out is, oh, wow, they're having to give away substantially okay. more money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You get it? Mm-hmm. Because did. what happens to schools that have weaker brands in the marketplace is they have to dangle really big merit-based scholarships or even need-based money Yeah. in order to get kids to come. They have, they, it's kind of like, you know, it's like anything else. You go buy, we're in the process of getting a new refrigerator. After the repairman came the other day and he told me it's going to be 600 bucks, I said, see ya. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So we're getting a new refrigerator. So when you look, there's going to be one refrigerator out there that's just trying to compete on price, right? Mm-hmm. Like if we don't, Maybe it's the no name one no one's heard of, but it's the lowest price. And then you're going to have everything up to top of the line. Well, it's kind of the truth with colleges as well. So some colleges, the only way they really can attract people is by saying we're like, you know, the most affordable. Mm-hmm. So just looking at enrollment data in itself won't help you if the numbers are going down. Mm-hmm. And if the amount of revenue per student is going down, 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 down then you can be in financial trouble. Does that make sense or not, Anika? It does. But at the same time, just to your point about, okay, just because they're enrolling people doesn't mean that they're not in a financial crisis. So you still have to compare, like, with the, if you're looking at enrollment data alone, you still have to almost always go to the financial data. 
Correct. And that's the point I'm making. Exactly. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to give you another source and this will be my last source for the day. This is what I was going to talk about last week for my bonus section in 115. Remember, Nika, I said I was going to do a whole series on Moody's ratings, Standard and Poor's ratings, but then so much incredible changes happened with standardized testing. I called an audible and did one on on how COVID is transforming standardized testing and I changed Mm -hmm, it. mm -hmm. But Moody's is, um, it's a fantastic source. Um, So is Standard and Poor's, but Moody's is the leader. And what Moody's does is it ranks schools according to their financial stability. Hmm. Because what happens is colleges um, have to take out loans a lot of times in order for their big building projects. In order to take loans, just like an individual, if you need a loan, what's your interest rate? What interest rate you get is going to depend on your credit. So what Moody's does is they study all this stuff. They study all of this stuff in order to ascertain whether or not a school is a good credit risk. Hmm. So they have all of these categories. Let me just pause for a second, Nika. I thought I had something here in my notes that I don't. I'm going to have to find it. (laughs) (laughs) And then I'm, I'm pretty much done after this, by the way. Okay. It's like my last thing because I... I know I'm getting really into the weeds. Mm -hmm. But I mean, for somebody who wants to know this information, this is kind of all the in the weeds you need to get. Oh, it's good weeds. (laughs) Okay, good. It's good weeds. Yeah, it's good weeds. I'm going to keep that quote. It's good weeds. (laughs) You can be so funny sometimes. There is a difference, I promise. (laughs) Between bad weeds and good weeds? Yes. You're funny. Crack me up. So what Moody's does, and by the way, Moody's has been around forever. This is not a new organization. This is a huge organization that has like over 10,000 employees, I believe. They started like in 1909. They're headquartered in New York City. Yeah, they have um, almost 12,000 employees. And so this is a big organization. And they rate other things too. But like I say, Moody's, Standards and Poor's, and the Fitch Group, those are considered the big three credit rating, credit raters out there. And so... What's nice is if you don't want to do all the stuff that I said, read financial statements and things like that, it's really easy to go to Moody's and see what they think of the riskiness of the colleges because they have a whole division that just ranks colleges. Mm-hmm. And what they do is they start out with what they call colleges that are investment grade. And and they have ratings of AAA or AA1. And this is like the highest quality rating, very, very low credit risks. And it goes all the way down to A1, A1, A2, A3. Then you get into the Bs, like medium grade risk, some speculative elements, but moderate risk. And then you get into what they call speculative grade. And now we're talking about judge to have certain speculative items and represent a credit risk. And this is important because if a school wants to build a new building project, they need a couple hundred million dollars, they have to get a loan and the Moody's ratings will impact the, the loan rate that they'll get. Hmm. And so, I know some people are thinking, well, how can I get access to this information? And the nice thing is it's actually really easy to get access to. So what you do is you go to Moody's.com. That's M-O-O-D-Y-S.com. And you are going to have to take out a a username and a password. And some of their content is premium, but quite a bit of it is free. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this really quickly. And then... But I'm going to look up one school really quickly on Moody's, and I'll show you what it says. So I'm here. I'm at my Moody's. I'm logged into my Moody's account, and I'll look up the University of Georgia, where Joy goes, and I'll tell you what it says. Do a live look up on the line. It's really easy. Just go to Moody's.com, take out a username, password, and then there's a big search bar in the middle. Put in any college you're interested in. Hit search and right away it'll pop up and here's the university of georgia popped up right away and they have a high rating Mm -hmm. so they are rated aa2 which is a very high rating and then of course it provides details university of georgia is the flagship land grant institution it goes on and on about that and then here's what it says i'll I'll read you a little bit more about the credit analysis Uh, this was done on november 15 2019 
So pretty recent. And it basically goes on. I'll just summarize it. It talks about over $200 million loan that's been taken, but the excellent support from the state itself and given growing enrollment trends, and it gives the statistics and high demand in the marketplace makes it a highly rated institution. So if you don't want to feel like doing all this stuff, you can just go right to Moody's and read the review. So Mark, all right, no, I said a so, lot there. But, 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 but wait, wait, wait. So on a Moody's review, when do we know that we need to be concerned? Is it a B? Is it a B minus or BAA or B1, whatever? Yeah. So that's a great question. So keep in mind the system, right, that I gave you where you go from investment grade all the way down to speculative grade mm-hmm. when I gave you the different ratings a second ago. Mm-hmm. But the other thing is Moody also gives you a narrative. So it will give you an an actual narrative as well. You know, it will describe to you how risky they feel the school is. Well, they're not necessarily approaching it from an enrollment standpoint. They're just talking about whether the school is on stable financial grounds, shaky financial grounds. Mm -hmm. So you can read the narrative paragraph. They'll also tell you the date of the most recent report. They will tell you if they have filed for specific loans what loan they they filed for. There's a lot of really good information in there. Wow. So I wouldn't focus as much on mastering the code, knowing the AA1 versus the BB2. Mm -hmm. You should know A is good, B is bad. Anything under that is terrible. Mm. That's good enough to know. But you can use the narrative description as well. Okay. So let me let me ask you this final question. So I, I'm assuming not, but do the college rankings incorporate any of this moody stuff into their thing? So guess what, Anika? It's, you are very, very prescient today. Hmm. So one of the reasons why schools are very obsessed with their U.S. News and World Report rankings mm-hmm. is it is one factor, one of the many factors that Moody's implements into its paradigm of schools is your newest U.S. News ranking. Really? Okay. It's not like the the main one because they're looking at all, they're looking deeply. Think about it. They're, if you're applying for a loan, you got to submit all your financials. Right. So basically what Moody's is doing, they're breaking all down your financial statements instead of you having to do it with their team of accountants. And they're looking at your balance sheets and then they're looking at all your enrollment trends. They're basically doing all the work for you and converting it to one of their code system. You can just look at their code system. I think they're 21 levels. I remember correctly, there's a lot. So if you really don't feel like doing all the work, and also you can go back and look at a past history too. So you can look at how their rating has changed and whether it's getting higher or lower over time. Hmm. So it's very helpful, you know? It's very, very helpful. But for clarity's sake, are you saying that Moody's is using the college rankings or college rankings is using Moody's? No. So Moody's looks at college rankings as one of the many things they use to incorporate into their evaluation. Uh, I'm going to read an actual printout from their uh, November 14, 2019, related to University of Georgia. So basically it says, Moody Investors has assigned an AA2 rating, which is very high, to the University of Georgia's proposal for $63 million in revenue bonds for the East Campus Housing Project. And it goes on to talk about the bonds they want for their housing project. The bonds will be issued through the Athens Housing Authority in Georgia. We'll have a final maturity date of December 2033. Moody's maintains an AA2 ratings on approximately $232 million of outstanding debt at the University of Georgia Real Estate Foundation. And that says, we regard this as stable. Then they have something called ratings rationale. And it says, the A2 rating incorporates the University of Georgia's excellent strategic positioning demand as Georgia's flagship public university with strong student and broad geographic appeal. The comprehensive university generated operating revenue of $1.7 billion in fiscal year 2019. This is up from 6% from the prior year. So if you don't want to go look at past trends and all that, they'll have a little summary here for you. Then they say the rating also acknowledges the university's low financial leverage with preliminary fiscal 2019. 19 total debt of 364 million for the university. Other strengths include healthy state funding from the AAA rated state of Georgia, close alignment with strategic priorities of the Board of Regents from the University of System of Georgia, which governs the university, prospects for ongoing growth of wealth 
aided by strong uh, fundraising and support credit quality. These strengths are tempered by limited, unrestricted liquidity and the fact that the lease revenue bonds are subject to renewal and abatement risk. And then it says, what is the ratings outlook? The stable outlook reflects expectations that the University of Georgia will maintain sound operating performance and strong debt service coverage and that spendable cash and investments will demonstrate growth for the future. So that's, and then it goes on to say, what would it take to be a downgrade? What would it take to be an upgrade? It has, so it's really good. Now that's one that was positive, but if I looked up one that, I mean, was negative, it would throw them under the bus. You can look it up. It's really, this is really easy. Just moody's.com and then username, password, and then big search bar in the middle, look up the school. And sometimes you'll see a lock beside it because mm-hmm. you'll see a bunch of articles. And if it has a lock beside it, like, you know, just looks like a little panel lock, then that means that it is premium information, mm. you know? And if it's premium information, then you got to pay. I don't have a paid account personally, mm. you know? I find I can get enough information off of the um, the free account to get what I need. But maybe you want to dive in the, into the paid account. I don't even know what they charge. I, I, I haven't even looked it up. I've always been able to find enough articles off of the free account that I can get what I want. Okay. So what are your thoughts, Anika? That was some good stuff, dog on it. Um, I think so. I think we did it. I think you did it. Excuse me. <laughs> I mean, it was very technical. And I'm, I'm sure like if this might board some people, but I think if Mm-mm. this is a question that's important to you, no, and I do really. think it's a very important right now because this COVID world is wrecking havoc on colleges' finances. Ooh. So the timing of Kim's the timing of Kim's question. Right. Could not be more apropos, you know. So, and I hate to, sh- I hate to stretch this out, Mark. I know you got to go, and I got to go. But in terms of when th- the impact of COVID, when would we look at Moody's or whatever all these other resources? How often is the data updated? Is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah. So, the financial reports you always want to be looking at the current ones and looking at the last couple, right? So, mm-hmm. like as soon as the 2020 stuff comes out, you want to be comparing that to the 19. Right. I'm trying to get the most the most current annual report. So is 20 coming out like January 1, January 5th? Like, is that how 21? Is that how that works? I mean, if it's colleges, they produce them at different times than when they go online. If you're doing mm-hmm. it that way. I don't know um, what month iPads has its new updated information, but uh, you get you got me on that one. And you could just have to keep checking and look and see if you're getting 20 data or 19 data. Gotcha. Can't tell you the month they all come out. OK. All right. Good luck, Kim. Good luck, everybody who said everybody. that question. And we've had at least everybody. at right. least three, if not four, people have said, "You guys are scaring me," because Dave and I talk quite a bit about all the colleges that are going to be closing, mm-hmm. and so it's starting to scare people. Like, hey, am I about to enroll in, the, in a school that's going to close? Mm-hmm. Or even if it doesn't close, it stays around, but it it's so cash strapped that they're shutting down departments, freezing salaries, you know, laying off people. That's stuff people want to know, too. Yeah. Please be scared. You should be. Yeah, this is one of those cases where it's a little good buyer beware. It's good to, I'd rather have a healthy fear and make you probe than get there. And maybe your school doesn't close, but if all the classes you want to get, you can't get because they had to lay off all the professors right. out of the, or even gut a whole department. Whew. That's the kind of stuff that you'd like. I'd rather everybody know that going in on the front end, you know? Mm, good stuff, Mark. So I'm giving you an assignment now, Anika. I want you to go to Moody's, <laughs> take out a username and password, go and punch in a co- anti state university. <laughs> well, punch in a co- punch in a couple schools that you're cur- you have curiosity about. Okay, could be anyone, and just kind of look it up. I'm gonna do and it, and I encourage all our listeners to do the same. You know, just punch in a couple schools you're thinking about, and read about them. And in episode 118, I'll talk a little bit more about the how to access that iPads data and the recommended Ooh, resource. We'll do it on it. This was heavy for Easter Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> they're not it was heavy. On, this they're is not listening to it on Easter though. <laughs> well we're doing it on Easter and <laughs> and it's funny I'm I'm doing my Dave in uh segment in five minutes. <laughs> ooh ooh gotta go. Yep, gotta go. Gotta go Joe. Listen, have a good week. I'm doing a session with Janae later this week, so it's all good. Yay. All right. Take care, Anika. Stay safe. Me too. Okay, friends. As we transition to the final segment of my interview with Taylor King, he continues to talk about using Columbus State 
as an example of a regional public. And the timing could not be better because a lot of people are looking at less expensive colleges and a lot of people are looking at colleges closer to home. And so what great time for us to feature regional public universities. Taylor makes some outstanding points um, about Columbus State as a regional public college. And then I put him on the hot seat and he was ready for me because he had some great answers. I think that you will enjoy. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Now, I know you have an honors college. Was the process that you described uh, the same process for admittance to the honors college or is that a separate process? And if, if it's separate, what's the application process like for the honors college and what would be the benefits to being in the honors college? It's the exact same process. Okay. Okay. And are there any benefits that are incurred by the attendee or recipient of an honors college um, slot at your school? Besides the finances? Right. So some of the benefits are going to be, you know, not just the, the opportunity to have, say that you went to an honors college, but priority registration, which is a really big deal. Um, our honors college students are able to participate in some zero credit hour courses. And so while they may not be getting credit, they're learning to do things in a much different way. And so they're taking these really fun, experiential learning type courses that, that our honors college students absolutely love. So they'll take popular subjects and turn them into classes. So, for instance, they've done Mythbusters and they've done some of the other really popular television shows, CSI type stuff, and just done that as activities for our students. There really is a, a great community of Honors College students on our campus. So there's Honors College housing, opportunities to go on trips with one another, not just in the local area, but across the Southeast as well. And so our Honors College really um, takes care of their students. And it's more than just a program. It really is a way for them to connect with one another because so many are coming from different parts of the state and different parts of the country. So Taylor, what would you say to the person that says, like, why do you not want to know what my extracurriculars are? Or why do you not want to see essays, you know, from me or see teacher recommendations? How are you able to make a decision without that kind of information in the file? What would be your answer to that? My answer to that is that that's a state mandated uh, requirement for us. And so of the 26 public colleges and universities in Georgia, there are just a few that use a holistic review, whereas most of us is going to be just GPA and test score based. Um, and so it's a much simpler process. We do, we're do we rolling admission. And so we can go ahead and cut out you know, the application decision dates. We get you a decision as soon as we process your information. Um, and so with just having that GPA and test score requirement, there's not a whole lot of application review. We can go ahead and make, get that decision out to students. A lot of re public regionals have an access mission or a mission for admitting students in their local area that may be a little bit lesser than their traditional admission requirements. We have that as well. And so we want to educate the people in our area. We want to get them a college degree. And by having all of those hoops for them to jump through, we would be unable to admit some of the students that really in our area need to be in our, need to be educated and need to be in our workforce. That makes a lot of sense. It does. Now for your honors college, the fact that you're interviewing, does that mean you're factoring a few other things into consideration? It but does. It, it does. So we do, that is more of a holistic review. So there are essays and recommendation letters required for the honors college, as well as that that interview that you would be required to do as well. And so for out-of-state students, I, I know I said you need to come to campus and do that. For some of our out-of-state students, you know, where travel may be prohibitive, uh, we do allow that to be videoed and like live streamed as well. That's great. And another thing that I want you to to share, uh, Taylor, is your your timeline. Like I know you mentioned your rolling admissions. and You'll get a decision out really quickly if someone applies in the fall. But, you know, there are a lot of families that, you know, maybe this whole coronavirus has impacted their earnings and their income, and they're looking for a real bargain. Um, I know st there's families I talk to that have told me they've had to change how much they can afford to pay for college. And so there's an opportunity for a 2020 student who's hearing this, you know, in the spring to still attend a Columbus for the fall. Why don't you talk about sort of your, your timeline on the backside yeah. as well? So, yeah, we'll start at the very beginning. So our application typically sure. opens up August 1. 
if a student applies August 1st and gets us their application, their transcript, and their test scores, I've seen students who have been admitted by the 3rd. So we can turn around wow. that quickly. As we progress further along through the semester and into the spring, it does take a little bit longer because we are just processing more and more documents. Students will get decisions from other colleges that are not necessarily the decisions that they want. And so they'll look at us and say, hey, you know, your application is still available. So our application deadline is June the 30th. Um, this year with spring of 20, with fall of 2020 students, we're going to extend that um, just because of what's going on with coronavirus. And so we're going to, we don't know what that final application date is going to be, but we're looking at sometime in July. With that, our application, requ- our admission requirements have changed because of coronavirus. So the state of Georgia, for all the public universities that are not holistic review, they have changed our admission requirements for summer 2020 and fall 2020 students. Uh, So for us, there is no SAT or ACT requirement for students that are coming in for summer 2020 or fall 2020. And the state of Georgia has actually lowered all of our GPA requirements as well. And that's across the university system. Uh, So ours now is around a 2.2. And so students that are looking, you know, that's a core GPA. So for students that are, you know, looking at a last second option or looking, you know, elsewhere, looking to save money, we have a very streamlined, very simple process now. It's just the application, the application fee in your high school transcript, and we can get you a decision, but just based on those items. This is fantastic. Um, I really appreciate this overview. It's really been great. Is there anything that you haven't shared on any topic that you you want to share before I put you on the hot seat? Uh, just to, you know, be open-minded about your college search process. Um, you know, the public regionals tend to get overlooked. And so uh, some of that may be because of graduation rates. Some of that may be because of sticker costs. You know, so, so people will see the price point and go, oh, that, I don't know about that. Like, that's a turnoff. I'd rather go to a private liberal arts that may or may not offer the same academic quality, but they'll go there because of the sticker price. So don't be shot by that. You know, I talk with families all the time and I tell them how much we cost and they're like, golly, there must be some catch. There's no catch. We're just funded through the state. And so that's where we get that deep t- uh, tuition discount that you may not get in other places. That's actually a really good point because just like people can get sticker shock on the high end and get turned off, they can also think, ah, oh, you must not be that good. Why are you so affordable, right? So that's 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 the other side, and I guess you would hear that sometimes. What's the catch? Exactly right. I, I hear it all the time, in my, especially in my more affluent areas here in the Atlanta area. Uh, people go, I, I just, I don't know. Like, I don't, I think that cost is too low. I'm like, well, I'm telling you, this is what it is. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hiding anything. This is, we're going to be very transparent about what our costs are. Well, I mean, you brought up the key point, which is is funded by state taxpayer dollars. Mm-hmm. So every time somebody works, whether it's Delta or Home Depot or UPS or all of the other big companies, Coca-Cola that we have in the state here, a chunk of uh, that's going to the University of Georgia system mm-hmm. to fund all the schools to keep the cost down. And that's true for really most every state in the country. Right. Has some type of uh, state financed education, whether it's your flagship or your regional publics that are being subsidized by taxpayer dollars. And even in addition to Columbus, I would encourage people to explore the regional publics um, in your local area as well. Uh, Because they can go overlooked and can be a great option. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, because our article was so bleak, we are giving you two recommended resources this week. And both of them are incredibly time sensitive. So there are advantages to listening to our podcast within the first three days after they're released. I want to thank Natasha for sending us this one. And the resource is Strive Scan is offering a virtual college exploration for four days. And those days are April 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd of this year. You will hear from admission officers with tips And over 300 colleges, that's right, over 300 colleges are participating. These 300 colleges will be coming from 40 states and 10 different countries. And best of all, this event is free. Just go to strivescan.com and all the information you need is on the homepage. Students should register because each panel 
they want to attend will require registration. Once they're registered, they will receive a confirmation email with their unique link to join the Zoom webinar. Students will also receive a barcode, but the barcode is not necessary for the virtual event. When you go to strivescan.com, you will also see the complete schedule of all of the sessions with their times, and you will also see the list of the 300-plus colleges that are participating. Now, the target group are 10th and 11th graders. NACAC and the regional ACACs had to cancel a lot of their fairs because of COVID-19, but they got creative and they're going virtual, and I cannot recommend this highly enough. That's strivescan.com. Friends, if you've been a long-time listener of our podcast, you will remember we had Carol Concor from George Washington University on our podcast on two different occasions as an interviewee. You will also remember we had Rick Clark, the Director of Admissions from Georgia Tech, on our podcast for an interview twice as well. Well, both Carol and Rick are pairing up with Ginger Fay, a former senior-level admission counselor at Duke, to do a webinar entitled The Impact of COVID-19 on Admissions and Testing. The webinar will be on Tuesday, April 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain, or 5 p.m. Pacific. Here's just one of the many questions they will answer on this webinar. With the decreased role of standardized testing in the college admissions process, what other factors will have increased weight in the evaluation process? We will include the registration link in the show notes for this webinar. So if you're not COVID-19 burned out, I strongly recommend this and, quite frankly, all of the Apple Ruth webinars. Now return to the final part, my interview with Taylor King. So can you give us the Columbus website? Sure. It's Columbus State, C-O-L-U-M-B-U-S, state, S-T-A-T-E, dot E-D-U. Yeah. And I know uh, there's probably going to be a lot of interest in your music program, especially the way you described it. Is there a section or something they should look up specifically about that if they want to explore that? So I would just Google Schwob, S-C-H-W-O-B, School of Music, Columbus State. Uh, go to the Music School webpage. You can also go to music.columbusstate.edu. That's a more direct path. And just learn more about the admission requirements So we have here for the School of Music here at CSU. Great. You ready for the hot seat? Let's do it. What what hobby or hobbies do you have, Taylor? Okay, so I am a, on a professional barbecue team, and I'm a professional barbecue judge. So that's my number one hobby. Nice. Love barbecue. Love you know barbecuing. Love tasting good barbecue. And so I, I include it on my resume, and people are like, really? wow. "Why would you put that on there?" I'm like, "Because it's an interesting fact. How many professional barbecue judges do you know?" So you're the first one I've ever met. So so what is a, how does that work? Like you do. You, Go to taste off contests or something, or how does that work? Yeah, so uh, I am a professional judge with an organization called the Georgia Barbecue Association. Georgia, uh, like most states, is a really big into barbecue. So we're traditionally a pork state. I had to go to barbecue judging school, which uh, was a half day, <laughs> a half day seminar where we learned about how to judge barbecue, what to look for. Not necessarily on taste, because taste is something that's acquired, but, you know, the, the texture and all that. So did that. And then uh, there's contests typically every weekend here in Georgia somewhere, um, mostly in southern Georgia, because uh, that's where a lot of the great barbecuers here are, are in the state. And so you just sign up. It's a labor of love. So you just volunteer. You drive to wherever. Uh, you sit down at a tasting table. We have three categories that we judge here at the Georgia Barbecue. That is uh, pork tenderloin, pulled pork, and ribs. And so you'll usually sample uh, five to six different items per uh, whatever you're trying. And so typically you sit at two different sessions. So you'll get six different tastings of pork, pulled pork, and then six different tastings of ribs, which is a whole lot to eat. Um, so, you know, you take your Ziploc bag with you, you sample a little bit and make your judge and then throw the rest in the bag and take it home to eat. And so it's a really fun hobby that my, uh, actually my cousin, my uncle got me a part of. And so it's just been fun. So I've judged all over the state of Georgia in different contests and tasted some excellent barbecue. 
Uh, our barbecue team will actually cook a couple of contests every year, usually one in the metro area. And then uh, we'll do one. We'll pick another one somewhere else and just, you know, load up and have a good time. It's a pretty expensive hobby. And so that's why we only cook a couple of times a year, but we judge way more than that. So that was fascinating. The only problem is now I'm really hungry and I'm craving yeah. some barbecue. <laughs> I think our listeners probably are as well. Yeah. So if you come so to Georgia, girl. look me up. I can I can recommend you some great barbecue restaurants. The, a lot of people ask me, you know, they're like, "What uh, what's your favorite barbecue restaurant?" I mean, I have some, uh, but most of the time when you're cooking, or you're eating and sampling the small batch, I call it small batch barbecue for contest, it's going to be so much higher quality than somebody who's trying to cook for hundreds of people. So, um, th- but we do have some excellent barbecue restaurants here in the state of Georgia as well. So if you ever make your way to the peach state, uh, look me up and I'll recommend some for wherever you're going to be. Yeah. Just look up Taylor King. You're visiting. You can just get his email right off the website and yeah. ask him for his barbecue recommendations and <laughs> he'll fire back at you. That's good. Speaking about food. What what's your guilty pleasure? That food that's not good for you, but you just can't resist it sometimes. Oh gosh, anything by Little Debbie or Oreos. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> I guess you could say barbecue too, but I don't eat a lot of barbecue outside the contest. But any of those like snack cakes and stuff, I just love them. Oh, I can't keep them. And this thing now that we're quarantined, I can't even go to the grocery store and buy them because I'll just eat them all so quickly. <laughs> what's your favorite TV show? Oh. I and I mean I enjoy reruns of older shows. So mm-hmm. everything from oh my gosh, this is gonna make me sound really old, but like the Andy Griffith show uh, <laughs> that I grew up with my dad to watching Seinfeld. <laughs> Newer shows it would probably be Shit's Creek. I really that it's just so well written and so funny. Mm. I enjoy that as well. But yeah, I, I, I try to watch a whole lot of TV, uh, but when I do, that would typically be it. Are you still a baseball game guy? Can watch a good baseball game after you're playing, or did you burn out on it? Uh, I burned out a little bit. It's hard for me to want to pay to go to a game. And so Mm -hmm. I'll sit and watch when we have the Braves on. I'll watch them and I'll go to a couple games each year. I'm actually more, I enjoy watching football and basketball more, but I'll sit and watch a good baseball game too. I'm more basketball and football too. (laughs) Baseball is just so slow. It is. It's it's beautiful because it's slow. There's a romance to it because it's slow. Um, It gives you time to digest everything, but it's, pretty difficult to watch sometimes i'm like okay yeah let's let's hurry it up a little bit i guess that romance just never rubbed off on me i never got <laughs> it but i like golf so you know people say golf is slow so hey, yeah man. yeah so yeah I, I understand that i enjoy watching golf too i i love sports so i can sit and watch almost any sport so yeah i was kind of devastated to lose the nba and then march madness like back to back yeah i was like a real whammy on me here. Mm-hmm. And what, now they, um, they just announced the Olympics are being postponed to 21. So I, yep. I heard that. I heard that. I heard that painful, painful, painful stuff. So, so Taylor, if you were not in admissions, what would be another career of interest to you? I would want to go into, I would actually be a baseball broadcaster. As much as I say it's boring, <laughs> my excitement level kind of get it, it's geared towards baseball. I was a communication major mm-hmm. and I wanted to go into broadcasting and, after being evaluated by some of my professors and some industry leaders, they said, you know, you would be really good at baseball, not as much at football and basketball, but your demeanor and your, your prose is more geared towards a baseball commenting. So that's be, that would be what I would want to do. Do that. Or I would, I would love to own a barbecue restaurant. I'm not going to lie. I'm sure. Um, yeah. Uh, I know opening a restaurant is a very you know, stressful and enduring uh, right. venture, but I would just love to experiment and have people sample different things. Cause I love, I love crazy barbecue, like things that are flavored a little bit different and stuff. So yeah. Anyway. And I always do a catering catering thing on the yeah, side. Yeah. Yeah. We've been asked to do that. We've, we've catered weddings. Uh, welcome to the wow. barbecue by cat product podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know with a little bit of higher ed mixed in. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting. It's interesting. I mean, yeah. I don't never ever met a barbecue contest uh taste tester <laughs> in my life so that's yeah. being both of your listeners well we gotta get you involved my resume too yeah we gotta get you involved we gotta get you certified to judge and uh, get your badge that's a big thing i get to wear my badge out and it makes me feel important <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the best book or two you've ever read oh my gosh 
Uh, what did I read? I read something recently. Oh, it was so good. I read a book and it was an insider. It was a guy who worked in Las Vegas and he was a, a valet, a bellhop. Wow. And just he got to see the inside secrets and tell all these inside stories, which was really cool. Yeah. And so I found that very interesting. That was a good one. That, that was I read that one just a couple of weeks ago. So that's what's on top of mind right now. But you just forget the name? Yeah, I forget the name. I hear you. My last question, uh, your best advice for a parent or your best advice for a student? And this, you know, student, 11th, 12th grader, about to enter the college process, parent, thinking about college, thinking about careers, anything come to mind? Yeah. So, and this goes back to, you know, the type of institution that I work for. Let like students be open-minded and be steadfast in where you want to go. Um, Now, where you go may not always be able, you know, financially to get there, but if there's a school you really want to go to, or you feel that connection when you visit a campus, really emphasize that to your parents and parents, let your student drive that car. Right. And so, I talk with people all the time and, you know, I've had parents tell me, I'm not letting my student come to a school like yours. And I say, what do you mean by that? You know, they're like, well, you know, you don't have this academic prestige or your graduation rates, things. And I I say, let your student, if that's where they want to be, that's where they're going to succeed. If you make them go somewhere and force them to go somewhere, they're going to be miserable. And so let them find their passion, let them explore it. And I know parents, you know, you may know best, you know your child better than they do sometimes, but sometimes they need to go out and they'll surprise you and they'll flourish. And so I've seen that so many times where a student will come to us after a parent really wasn't excited about it. And the student just did so well. And, you know, I've been around over 10 years at Columbus State. So I've seen my students graduate and get jobs and truly go all around the world with their degrees. And so that's my best piece of advice. Great, great, great. Listen, Taylor, this has been fantastic. Really appreciate you taking the time to come on here today. And um, as you know, I'm working with you on coordinating a, a, a school trip with a whole bunch of students to bring them out to see your wonderful university. And uh, you and I can plan that offline, but I'm, I'm really excited. Well, let this Corona stuff die down, and but we're definitely going to make that trip happen. I, I did it once before, and it was a great trip, and looking forward to doing it again. All right. We look forward to having you guys on campus. Again, yeah, we love it when you guys come to visit us. All right. Thanks. Next week in the news, because things are changing so quickly, we will announce our article at the time of the podcast. Mark and Nika will discuss chapter 117, How Can I Increase My Need-Based Aid? Our question from a listener will be, how do you look at the endowment to best understand a college's financial health? Our interview will be with Vincent Garcia, the first of a four-part series on understanding the 23 colleges in the California State University system. And our college spotlight will be Chapman University in Orange, California. Dave, 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 we got our depressing podcast out of the way. I'm worried about you, man. You got to go in and face all those COVID (laughs) patients tomorrow. That's That's okay. I'm waiting. I'm meeting my buddy after this podcast. We're going to go down to 7-Eleven and have a drink. Oh, your buddy's the drunk that walked into the emergency room. <laughs> That's right, man. <laughs> so, you know, know. Tell, tell our listeners what the emergency room's like. You told me the other days, there's this going on, there's that going on. That was like interesting. Paint the picture of what you normally see. Oh, well, normally it's a, it's a panoply of right? everything. You know, it's heart attacks, it's gunshot wounds, it's people coming in with aches and sprains. The beauty of the emergency room is you never know it's like Forrest Gump. You know, it's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get from one shift to another. And that's what I love about it. And there's a natural sort of energy to it, uh, craziness, uh, especially in the, the urban centers. Um, it's not like now. I mean, it's only one thing that we're seeing and it's uh, all COVID all the time. And uh, the patients are sick and uh, they're sort of quietly sick. So you walk in and despite the fact that it's quite busy. Um, it's also eerily quiet. So well, what percentage of people come in with like a sniffle or something, but in their mind, they thought it was, you know, this momentous event and they could have just like gone to urgent care or, you know, or taken a couple Advils. How often, what percentage of people are like that? Well, prior to this, I would have said it was only about 20%. But okay. what has truly been stunning is that for the emergency rooms outside of the hot zone, 
we have seen our company, which is uh, Team Health, which has over 500 emergency departments throughout the country, has seen nationally almost a 50% drop in volume in emergency department visits. And I was even reading an article about where have all the heart attacks gone, that heart attacks themselves has dropped over 60, 70%. And people can't figure out, are people just having their heart attacks at home or not coming in? So, so the stunning thing for me was what I would have thought was the extent, expendable portion of the emergency. The, those people who, who have the option of not coming in, I would have only said was 20%, but, but the data is showing that it, indeed it's much higher. So that's concerning, and and we'll see what percentage of that volume comes back. But you and I have already talked, Mark, that I think a portion that, that is going to be permanently lost to to telehealth and to urgent care centers and to, to whatnot. So, so we're, yeah, we're Dave knows I, I, Dave knows I dropped a grand on telehealth stock this week after looking at these trends. I'm like. I'm going to invest in some telehealth. <laughs> he did. He did. I, I, I don't tend to like to invest in things that'll put me out of business, but that seems to be a good one. <laughs> That's not what I was trying to do, my friend. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> but I was like poo-pooing telehealth. Who's going to see a doctor <laughs> on a TV screen? And it turns out quite a few people. <laughs> <So> <laughs> more than so I thought. I <laughs> The resistance was. Last question for you. So I know you were licensed in 12 states. Now I need to say you're licensed in 13 states because they fast-tracked you and got you licensed uh, in in New Jersey so you could work with the patients there. So should we expect you to be coming to us from New Jersey uh, for the next few weeks, or is this just uh, a short one-week assignment? Well, it's a 60-day license, so we'll see how far that gets me. (laughs) I'll be here at least until the end of May. And then I'll, uh, I think they're moving me back to Connecticut. Uh, I might pick up some job work in New York City, but uh, it's very hard to predict where the market needs are going to be in the next few months. Um, only that they'll be somewhere and whatever they are, that's where I'll be. So, all right. Well, stay safe. I will, Mark. And, and, and everybody, thank you so much for, for your thoughts and your prayers and, your offers of the cookies all are, are greatly appreciated, and it really does help me get through my day. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. Your College Bound Kid is produced by Dave Vasaya of PodcastEngineers.com. If you find this podcast helpful, It would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that can really use this information. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Our image editor is Tauha Khan. Webmaster is Stalianos Dimitru. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. And if you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like to ask us, and we'll include them on the show, you can just email us at questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.